Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting us to spend some time. I think it's my first time to Wagga. My name is uh, Zach Matthews. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we stand. I'd also like to extend a prayer for all Australians. God blesses uh, those who call this country home with peace, happiness and uh, security. Thank you to the organizers, the museum, the Muslim Association for inviting me uh, to share some thoughts with you today. And thank you for coming and uh, sharing your time generously um, to listen to and raise some of your questions that you have about Islam and Muslims in Australia. I, I see a lot of uh, women, uh, mothers, daughters, and wives in the audience. Uh, I wonder what have you done to all the men? <laughs> <laughs> I hope nothing sinister has happened to you. <laughs> Okay, let me start. Um, some history. For more than 40,000 years prior to European settlement, indigenous Australians followed belief systems which were embedded in complex oral traditions and based on the force of nature, ancestral influence, and reverence for the land. Integral to indigenous belief systems were creation stories notably Aboriginal stories of, of the dream time, which combined knowledge, customary law, and beliefs about the origin of the land and its people. A belief in the interconnectedness of spiritual, human, and natural phenomena continues to permeate indig indigenous mythology, ceremonial life, and artistic traditions. The first known contacts between indigenous people and outsiders with different belief systems reach back to the 16th century, when Muslim fishermen and traders from the East Indonesian archipelago visited mainland Australia. They were known as the Macassans. The 2012 report, Mapping Social Cohesion, reviewed findings from a large-scale survey that considered Australian attitudes towards religion. So this was not too long ago, just two years ago. The report indicated that nearly 25% of respondents attested to negative attitudes towards Muslims. I wonder if that is represented in this audience today. <laughs> but don't worry about it. We are here to learn and to experience and perhaps change our perspectives. And we know that the context of that survey comes in the wake of the September 11 bombing, the Bali bombing, and the war on terror. So what about Muslims in Australia? The 2011 census found that we numbered 467,000. That might sound a lot. That might scare some of you. But it is only 2.2% of the total population. Studies have been shown that if you asked average Australians about that number, it was four times that. So in, in people's minds and perceptions, they think that we are 10%, when in reality we are only 2.2%. The number of Christians in Australia uh, in the 2011 census numbered 61%, and that was a drop from 95% 100 years ago. In 2011, the number of Christians in this country was 95%. Unlike um, the misconception that Islam is the fastest growing religion in Australia, we are not the second largest religion. In fact, Buddhism is at 2.5%. And the fastest growing religion from the 2006 census was not Islam, but it was in fact Hinduism. Dr. Christina Ho, a lecturer at the University of Technology in Sydney in 2007, wrote a paper called Muslim Women's New Defenders, Women's Rights, Nationalism and Islamophobia in Contemporary Australia. And she pointed out that a discourse of protecting women's rights has enabled Islam to be portrayed as inherently misogynistic and therefore a threat to Australia's egalitarian culture. This racialized paternalism was clearly articulated in debates surrounding the December 2005 Cronulla riots. She continues and adds that instances of Muslim men harassing and sexually assaulting non-Muslim women 
have triggered a nationalistic response founded on the protection of our women. This gendered discourse allows Muslim misogyny to be, to be portrayed as a threat to national security as lines of connection are drawn between the mistreatment of women and global terrorism. The butterfly and your first class upgrade. The success of this strange logic on the op uh, depends on the obscuring of misogynistic elements of mainstream Australian culture, enabling an essentialist bifurcation of egalitarian West versus oppressive Islam. Dr. Aziza al Khidri, the first Muslim professor of law in the world at Richmond University in the US, wrote a paper in the year 2000 entitled Muslim Women's Rights in the Global Village Challenges and Opportunities. She highlights a particular problem, and that is that problematic jurisprudence was often the result of a misunderstanding or misapplication of the Quranic text resulting from cultural distortions or patriarchal bias. And it's at this particular point that I just want to highlight something about this issue, this problem of where textual uh, text, religious texts, are being misused, misappropriated, and misapplied for whether it is political agendas or violent goals, and this is exactly what ISIS is currently doing. And I'd like to refer you to an open letter with regard to ISIS, and I'm, I'm not sure whether most of you know that ISIS, ISIS not too long ago issued a fatwa, a religious edict, um, specifically mentioning Australia by name, where they are asking their lone rangers to act independently of anybody um, with regard to their violent action. So what happened was these more than 120 uh, high-ranking Muslim scholars from around the world issued an open letter to ISIS denouncing their religious decree. And they based that, their letter on this fact that ISIS is misappropriating, misapplying, uh, misunderstanding, distorting, uh, and hijacking, in fact, religious texts for their own violent agendas. So let's move on to culture and religion, because this is another problem. The distinction between and relationship of culture and religion is critical for understanding Islamic law, Sharia, another term that engenders, it's, it's, it's one of those uh, uh, words that some in the media like to, like to use. The Quran is, is the revealed word of God, whereas culture is human fabrication. Cultural practices and values that masquerade as religious ones are insidious insofar as they may mislead Muslims into believing that they have divine origins. Some of the major misleading cultural biases relate to issues of democracy and women's rights. So the question is, is there a place for culture in Islamic law? Cultural practices that have often been introduced legitimately into the Islamic legal system. The Quran celebrates ethnic, racial, and other forms of diversity. The condition for inclusion of culture is that these customs must be consistent with the basic tenets of Islam itself. Sadly, some countries that claim to be following Islamic law often use religion to justify repugnant laws that are really based on customary practices alien to the law, especially those related to patriarchal assumptions. Does Islam promote gender equality or gender equity? I'm going to do the difficult questions myself. <laughs> but you can keep the more difficult ones for the Q&A session. The Quran states repeatedly for emphasis that both the male and the female were created from the same single soul. For believing men and women, devout men and women, God has prepared forgiveness and a great reward, from chapter 33, verse 35. There is therefore no human hierarchy, and the two genders share a single origin. In the Quran, the fall of Adam is not blamed on Eve. Rather, both were tempted by Satan and sinned in the pursuit of power and eternal life. Furthermore, God forgave humanity after their fall. There is therefore no continuing burden of the original sin. Men and women are responsible towards God for their own mortal choices. 
They are both judged by the same standards. They also have the same rights, duties, and obligations in matters of worship. In short, a Muslim woman is as complete a spiritual being as the male. She is as entitled as he is to read the Quran and to live a full pious life. There are, however, here's where the thought comes in. There are, however, some real differences between men and women. In the realm of transactions which regulate civil matters, the Quran states, and the male is not like the female. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. <laughs> This is where equity, rather than equality, becomes the divine goal. In civil, as opposed to spiritual matters, the Muslim woman is an independent legal entity, not lost through marriage. She retains her own name after marriage. Interesting. She also retains her financial independence. She can own property in her own right, whether she is married or single. And no one, not even her husband, may access her funds or properties or demand any form of fin financial support from her. Islamic law differentiates between the financial rights and obligations of the two genders and presents an equitable rather than equal platform. The male, while also financially independent, however, has additional financial burdens, obligations. He must support the woman in his family regardless of their financial situation. For example, a father is responsible for the support of his daughter, regardless of her age. But if she marries, that responsibility is transferred to her husband. The logic, and you may not agree with this, the logic of these differences in obligation lie in the fact that the Quran provides women with added security. And you may ask, why does she need that added security? Put in today's legal language, the Qur'an engages in affirmative action with respect to women. The Qur'an also gives the woman additional opportunities to accumulate wealth. For example, upon marriage she has the right to expect a gift from her husband, a dowry. The dowry signifies the willingness of the husband to undertake the responsibilities of marriage. Sadly, today the patriarchal reality in some Muslim countries is quite different from the Islamic one that I have just outlined to you. Fathers negotiate based on status, prestige. Some fathers misappropriate the money to cover wedding expenses, etc. In these cultures, the woman has become vulnerable financially and has lost a good measure of her God-given independence. Do women have a right to work? The Quran stated 1400 years ago that both men and women have a right to work. Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet, was a businesswoman and continues to serve to this day as a lofty ideal for Muslim women. Again, until recently, patriarchal laws prohibited women from entering the workforce under the guise of protecting women's morality. What about the important narrow cultural role and balancing responsibilities? Islam promotes balancing these priorities without sacrificing the important carer-nurturer role of the mother, sometimes compromised in certain Western cultures today. The Islamic view is one of marital partnership, where these priorities are balanced equitably rather than equally, where they are viewed as complementary and not competitive. Do Muslim women inherit less? The Quran does specify that the male sibling inherits double the amount inherited by his sister. On the face of it, unfair. Why? But it is not always the case that a woman inherits less. And the legal justification is that the amount inherited by the sister is a net amount added to her wealth, while the amount inherited by her brother is a gross amount from which he will have to deduct the expenses of supporting various women, elderly men and children in his family, one of whom may be the very same sister. To whom does Islam assign guardianship in the house? Does the man wear the pants or the woman? 
God in the Quran says that men are the supporters of women. The Arabic word that is used is iwama, awama, translated as protector and maintainer. Unfortunately, some Muslim men have misused this term to claim superiority. What was that? I'm not <laughs> So what about housework? The Quran views the marriage contract as a contract for companionship and not one of service. As a result, the woman is not required to clean, cook, or serve in her house. If she does these things, however, it is a voluntary contribution. Otherwise, the husband is obligated to bring her food and to take care of the house. Muslims today, living in Western societies, myself included, have been affected by Western cultural practices. <laughs> <laughs> what about the Quranic verse regarding hitting a woman? Yes, there is a verse in the Quran which talks about hitting women. Chapter 4, verse 34. To understand the context, you have to recognize that the Quran was revealed 1400 years ago and that the Quranic divine approach was one of gradualism and a transitory stage in a society that was steeped in domestic violence. Sadly, Australia still has not rid itself of domestic violence. We still have, on average, one woman killed every week in our country through domestic violence. And when the companions were surprised about this verse, they came to the prophet for clarification about this verse, and he said, no, it was symbolic. It was a symbolic gesture, and the prophet used the symbolism of a toothbrush, meaning that you're not really meant to hit. And this is similar to Christian teachings with prophet Job, where he referred to a handful of glass. The Prophet then, in that transition of this law, highlighted to his followers, how can, you, how can one of you hit his wife, then later embrace her? It, it doesn't make sense. And finally, the Prophet's final verdict on this matter was, do no harm. A Muslim wife, therefore, has the right to seek divorce for abuse. Why are two female witnesses required when they equal one male goodness. There is a verse in the Quran. Chapter 2, verse 282. Oh, you who believe, when, when you deal with each other in transactions involving future obligation in a fixed period of time, commit them to writing and get two witnesses out of your own men. And if there are not two men, then a man and two women, such as you choose for witnesses, so that if one of them, that is one of the women, errs, the other can remind them. There are, however, five other Quranic verses which mention witnesses without specifying gender. So gender was specifically mentioned in this particular case. Why? Because the context, again, going back 1400 years ago, was that there were significant gender differences with regard to awareness of business transactions. Khadija, as a businesswoman, the first wife of the Prophet was the exception to the rule. Differentiation was therefore based on qualification and experience, not on gender. 
And some jurists have also extended that by analogy, by legal analogy, to include homicide due to emotional differentiation. So in conclusion, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave women their rights 1400 years ago. And Islam has a rich legacy of female scholarship. Sadly, we don't see a lot of that today. There is a scholar from the UK, a Muslim scholar from the UK, who has published not too long ago, a few years ago, published a 40-volume biographical dictionary of Muslim women who studied and taught hadith, the reported words of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Today, we are observing two interconnected problems with everything that is happening around us. The first problem is racial paternalism, which in its extreme manifests as Islamophobia. So that's from outside the Muslim community. And the second problem is within the community, where we have patriarchal practices, patriarchal biases, patriarchal cultural practices, which in their extreme also manifest as cultural misogyny. So the challenge therefore is for all of us here today to pursue truth and justice while cautious of those who plot otherwise. Thank you very much for your attention.